All right, everybody. Welcome to Freedom Fridays. I'm Pastor Brian with Empower Christian Ministries. Here back with you, excited to get into the topic of spiritual warfare. Load up your questions in the chat, and I will keep an eye on them. There's a lot of uh, awesome things that have happened this week already. God is moving, and so get Get on board with what God's doing in the world. Um, definitely, we man, we saw we saw him moving last night. A um, bunch of people set free, healed, encountered the Holy Spirit. I had testimonies from my own life, and then uh, you know, uh, one girl was was with us last night, and she was. She was just sitting there. She actually uh, got her stuff to leave the small group. We went an hour over where we were already normally doing. And then she's just sitting there and she's like, wow. And we're like, what's going on? And she goes, I've never felt this way before. And she's like, yeah, I have all my stuff here. I'm like ready to go, but I feel like I can't leave yet. <laughs> She's like, I've never felt this way before. And then uh, earlier today saying, yeah, now she went and was speaking with her boyfriend and he's asking her questions about God and Satan and, and just learning more about the gospel. And so she's she's witnessing to him because she's a new believer, just a couple weeks old, um, you know, kind of struggle, went back and forth for a long, a lot of time, but really uh, is pretty new in the faith. Just got plugged into the church a couple weeks ago and um, I led her through a salvation prayer before we did communion together. Um, and yeah, and then, you know, another person ha had deliverance and then uh, gave another testimony earlier today. Uh, you know, and so it's God moves in lots of different ways. So if, you know, there's so many different ways to get freedom. You know, and, and I want to encourage you guys definitely load up questions in the chat. I'm going to keep an eye on YouTube. And uh, and then on some of the other um, systems as well. But uh, yeah, so we were. I just I just felt with with the small group that that I'm uh, with on Thursday. I felt the Lord yesterday morning lead me to say, okay, you're going to take this group through curse breaking, and and then you're all going to kind of take turns laying hands on one another. And so that's what we did. <laughs> I, re I put on uh, one worship song, put on Break Every Chain by Tasha Cobbs. And so, and I'm like, yeah, when we're doing this, I'm just, it was a small group, uh, I think seven or eight of us. And I'm like, I just started leading people through a curse break and renunciation prayer. And everyone was just shouting back to me. And then I was like, yeah, if you feel the Holy Spirit, put something else in your heart, add that to the list. And then people were throwing out stuff and were shouting and um, you know, some people were already having encounters and feeling deliverance and, and just, um, I actually heard one person kind of manifesting a little bit, but he was just pushing through it and just kept renouncing stuff. And, and then right after I thought we were going to go through the song once. So I'm like, all right, five minutes. I literally stopped and re, you know, and, and started over the song at least four times, maybe five times. And uh, I, I do I do see one question. Um, yep, you can always just uh, load up the chat and just put a Q, um, you know, and then I'll, I'll kind of pay attention to it. Um, I, I invited uh, several people on, so I, I don't see him yet. Hopefully we'll see him soon. And, uh, but yeah, so I, I think this is just encouraging to know that God moves in different ways. And so um, we were... We were renouncing, renouncing things, and that's all curse breaking is, is basically just renouncing uh, the, your, participa your participation um, or agreement with whatever the sinful thing is. And so there's something powerful about renouncing it, about declaring it. God wants us to step in this, and there's... Um, is something powerful about that. So we, you know, we did it for, I just felt the Lord keep leading me like, no, do more, do more. <laughs> so I kept going. And then we transitioned. I put on another worship song. I think I put on, uh, fill me up. 
and I can't remember who the artist was, but maybe Kim Walker Smith. And it was one of the longer extended ones. So, and I'm like, yeah, what we're going to do is we're going to take turns praying over each other. And so one person came up first and we all just got, you know, just went around him in a circle and we all laid hands on him. And I just kind of led prayer. Um, and I, and I told everybody, I'm like, you can just kind of amen and come into agreement with what I'm saying. Definitely. If you want to speak prophetic words, you know, feel free to do that. If you want to um, pray your own prayers, that's fine. Pray in tongues, that's fine. Just uh, let's just let this be a spirit led moment where we're pouring into one another and just letting the Holy Spirit be in control of this thing. And yeah, it was powerful. So we have, and, and I told everybody from the beginning pray for everything for each other. Like, Pray for total deliverance. If there's anything demonic in this person, that it's leaving in Jesus' name. Renounce it. Come, you know, if you break curses in Jesus' name, if uh, any attachment, you know, open doors, witchcraft, demonic dreams, you name it, renounce it, throw it out, break it off. Um, also, physical healing. Pray for total physical healing, healing of the mind, healing of the body. I also said to uh, pray that the Holy Spirit would consume more of them, um, you know, and so we also, uh, I anointed everyone with oil before each person went, and I actually went last and let everybody do me as well, and so, you know, just because, you know, one person will be in leadership doesn't mean that you're above being able to be blessed by the Holy Spirit moving through other people, and so, uh, prayed for pray for total healing, physical healing, mental healing, emotional healing, healing of trauma, whatever. Right, Holy Spirit, take over, make us more like Jesus. Also had people pray for um, activation of spiritual gifts. Lord, prophesy that let this person be able to prophesy, to lay hands on people and heal them, to be able to um, have dreams and and revelations from you. Uh, may they encounter you more deeply. May they be able to lead and 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 minister and share the gospel and you know every good gift and you know speak to them. May they have understanding in their calling and all of this kind of stuff. And so basically, just blessing, just blessing people, um, ministering to people. And so people were taking turns. Some were getting words and just really feeling like. People needed to just stop and just get hugged and, and be told that they're loved and be told that they have family and we're community and we are, you know, brothers and sisters, we're children of God and, you know, let go of the shame and the guilt of things. And, and yeah, so the Holy Spirit was just moving. We went easily two hours, if maybe even longer than that. Uh, we, and it, so it was awesome. Everybody was touched. Um, a lot of people felt healing and deliverance and just God moving, feeling the presence of the Holy Spirit. We actually wrapped up and then I'm, you know, kind of getting things kind of cleaned up and, and people are getting ready to leave. And somehow worship accidentally got like, like one of the background songs started playing another video and we all just kind of stopped what we were doing and went back into worship mode. <laughs> and it was like 10 o'clock at night or something. We were just like, all right, we're going to worship again some more. Um, and then the audio was weird. And so for some reason, I had the volume cranked way up and the audio was way down. And everybody, um, we all just, you know, we're using lyric videos. And so we all knew the words and um, we all were just singing and we were carrying it. And it was just... Um, at one point, we were all worshiping and kind of like with our arms around one another like this and just like united in spirit. And um, yeah, it was just it was just powerful. And so um, one and so one other thing that happened, uh, one of one of the people messaged the group uh, earlier today and said they they felt free. But there was they woke up this morning still with one thing kind of hanging on. And they felt let, so they went into prayer mode and started talking to God about it, which is what you need to do. Have a relationship with God. If you have not experienced freedom, 
develop a deeper relationship with the Lord and the Holy Spirit will lead you to freedom. And so he's like, yeah, I felt the Lord lead me to, to start worshiping and then to, to go, um, you know, to go take a shower and do this and that. And just kind of, he just kept submitting. He kept seeking the Lord's will and saying, I want to be free totally. And what do I need to do next? What do I need to do next? And he just, the Lord like led him on this process. Um, he didn't say how long, it might've been an hour or two hours, but he says, yeah, at some point he just felt there it went, felt it go. The thing he felt still hanging on left, right? He felt it go. And so how powerful is that? You have, you know, sometimes it's, we have to confront demons very directly and and we cast them out in jesus name we have to tell them we have to identify them by name we you know i even a lot of times will have them renounce their own rights and say that they are going so that they're bound by their own word and that's powerful but then there's like an opportunity where oh you're just going to do this group experience and stuff might be leaving in the middle of worship because you are sanctifying yourself because you are you're a temple of the holy spirit and as you give more of yourself which is your mind your will your emotions and your body to the lord stuff has to go that gets in the way of that and so you have this power encounter where stuff leaves and the holy spirit gets more of you and then you have the benefit of other people laying hands and praying for one another and then you have this and then you have this additional experience where it's just about submission and being obedient and letting God lead you to certain steps and in a way that only he can do. And there's such a benefit to that because it's not about somebody else doing it for you, right? If somebody else is doing it for you, there's always going, there's always going to be a type of a, a dependency where it's about other people having to do something long term we you know and obviously we're a body we all come together we support one another we're meant to be a church like this but there's something very powerful and it's what god wants when we can work together with the lord and be led by him to start taking steps that that move us into the calling and the freedom that god has for us and so there is this so he felt something leave just by obeying God and kind of partnering with the Holy Spirit in this moment. And so that how powerful is that? And so there's there's lots of different ways that freedom can be accomplished. Don't, don't ever make it a formula. We're talking about a real God, a personal God who wants a relationship with us, who lives in us. And we're talking about real spiritual beings, demons that are our enemy. And so you know, formulas and, and these things can help. They can help us, uh, you know, make sense of it and work through things. But at the end of the day, develop a close, intimate relationship with the Lord and walk in holiness, right? That's what curse breaking is. You are renouncing sin. You're renouncing evil. You're renouncing brokenness, the brokenness that you have done, the sin you have done, as well as the sins of your ancestors, and you're renouncing ungodly soul ties, soul connections with other people. And so what you're doing at, fundamentally is you're saying, I want more of my life to be in line with God's will for my life. And I want to renounce and reject and cast off and be set free from everything that disagrees with that. Right. And this is what God's will is for us, for us to be holy, for us to be his children. And so um, I see a few other people have joined us. Definitely click like, um, leave a comment and and share, share this with with people. So that way we can uh, get it up in the ranks and um, definitely load some more questions. I have a few loaded up already, but um, I think it's powerful. I think we we need to know that there's different ways that these things work out and uh and uh you know and and pursue pursue all these different ways for us to become more like jesus and know that god is moving and doing things uh you know and really all of that you know and i didn't even share everything one you know another person um was really touched by it and blessed by it and i saw her start to grow in her gift um and another 
so one person was really moving into uh, what I feel like the Lord will be will end up being a counseling kind of a, a gifting, and another um, actually prophesied to me. Did you know? It was the new the new believer? She didn't realize it. I don't know if she's watching, <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, she actually prophesied to me about my ministry in the future and didn't even realize it. She's like, you're so good at teaching and and I love, you know, I just, you know, the other girl's like, I love it. Every time I come here, I just, it's so amazing. And they don't realize they're actually, um, the one girl was prophesying, the other one was giving, you know, using the gift of encouragement. And so God moves. And so people were, um, yeah, one of the other guys, he was prophesying out loud, boldly. He started preaching like while we were in the middle of this. It was, um, it was so cool. And so, yes, let God do what he wants to do. Seek him always and just be obedient. Listen to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Go and check out the video that I posted a week or two ago called How to Hear from God. Get better at li- listening to God. And then you're going to be able to let him guide you to start stepping out in faith and obedience. And when you do that, God's going to move in your life. So definitely load up, load up the questions. Uh, You say, you see the joy of the Lord on me. Yes. Amen. I was, you know, when you're doing all Christians, we, we can go through these seasons where it, life gets stressful. Um, Even when things are going well, sometimes it can be overwhelming or you feel like I'm not getting enough fruit. And definitely when you're in leadership, when you're in ministry, you know, you have days where you're like, am I even, is this even accomplishing anything? Like, is this, you know, this ministry is still fairly young and fairly small in our influence. And I would, I'm hopefully waiting for the, the day when I can, um, when I can believe that I have influence to a bunch of people and being able to impact people for the kingdom. But so it's, there's these moments where it's like, Oh, am I even, do, you know, does God even want me to be doing this? Otherwise, wouldn't it be more successful? And I bet a lot of you ask that sometimes, am I even doing the right thing? Because if I, then why, why isn't it working? Why aren't I getting the results that I want if I'm tr- if I'm already doing what I'm supposed to be doing? And sometimes we aren't doing the right things. And other times we are and we need to grow in our patience, grow in our trust of the Lord, and grow in our self-control, our discipline, so that way we can um, learn what God's trying to teach us. And so if... You know, it's one of the reasons why I created the Empower Christian Roadmap, because it is a step-by-step outline so you can see the big picture and know that you're doing the right thing, even if you don't see all of the results you want all at once. And so, yeah, I just I just felt that. But yeah, I was totally encouraged and blessed, and I felt the Lord moving. And yeah, and so I it blessed them, but it blessed me as well. And that's one of the amazing things. Um one of the girls, she's like, I've never felt the Holy Spirit like this before. And I, you know, she had, and she, I, and for several weeks now, I've been watching her, you know, probably, probably between church, small group, and then this other discipleship thing that we're doing at the church, probably seen her seven, eight times worshiping the Lord, sermons, teachings, testimonies. Um, but it was just this encounter. And I said, yeah, when you pray for people, when you lay hands on people and you ask the Lord to move through you and you start ministering to their needs, they get touched by the Holy Spirit. And God like does this thing where you get like the splashback of it. <laughs> like they get most of it and you get like the splashes of the Holy Spirit just as like an encouragement that you get to share in it basically god says this when you know the 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 farmer gets to share in the harvest right so when we're praying for people we get blessed by that when other people get set free of demonic bondage we get blessed by that when they get healed we get blessed when they get saved we get blessed and so step out in faith and start pouring into other people you'll be blessed by it and it, it may just be the thing that you need to help uh, start walking in greater freedom yourself. All right. So let's jump into some questions. 
Question number one. Could it be more difficult to hear the Holy Spirit or to at least distinguish the voice of the Holy Spirit from demonic voices for someone who is demonized? Hmm. Uh, yes. Yeah. I've had um, a number of people who who struggle with demonic bondage of some sort and but also are charismatic and you know really i would say let me say this um when it's demons it's usually pretty sort of forceful right when it if demons were way 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 far away from you we probably wouldn't even call this demonization. We would just, you know, be demonic influence or sort of like the fiery darts of the evil one where it's kind of far away. It's the occasional thing. When that happens, um, we probably wouldn't even really notice it or even think it's demons, right? We just think it's ourself or the flesh of the world. And so, but when it's, you know, but when a person has demons and they have a significant level of oppression to the point where we would say the person is demonized, then the demons are usually kind of obvious. They they either talk audibly or they give thoughts kind of relentlessly or they they exert a certain a pretty high degree of of influence and pressure. And so when that happens, it's. It, there, it feels like they're so close that 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 people who read the scripture and hear that this, like the Holy Spirit telling Paul to go this way, or the Holy Spirit said, you know, this, and then a person prophesied or something like that, it, they might think, oh, that must be the Holy Spirit. And since demons are counterfeiters, sorry, I'm getting uh a little notification. Okay. Since demons are counterfeits, right? Satan masquerades as an angel of light. Since he does that, they will often pretend to be the Holy Spirit. They'll, or, or you know, a lot of times they'll pretend to be an angel if, if you don't, or they'll pretend to be something good, right? A spirit guide or something if you don't know truth, ultimately. Um, so there is this they pretend to be something good. They try to influence you. A lot of times they might not even tell you that they are the Holy Spirit or that they're Jesus or something like that. They'll just try, they'll just kind of act like it and then you'll assume it sometimes. The The reality is that the Holy Spirit will, for one, he There's a, there's a lot of things. So for one, they demons will try to strongly influence you to do evil or to go against God's will in some sort. And they can get away with this if you don't know God's will. If you don't know who God is, if you don't know his character, if you don't have a relationship with him. So spend time with God. Spend time in the word of God, spend time in Bible study and in worship and in listening to sermons and being a part of small groups and reading godly books, you know, either stuff written more modern or even like the, the classics. Those are going to edify you and give you the ability to, to think biblically. So that way you understand who God is. And, uh, you know, we did a, um, I did a, I think a Freedom Friday several weeks ago where I said, here's how you can distinguish the voice between um, Satan and the sinful flesh. And uh, pretty soon I'm going to do another one on here's how to distinguish between God and sort of the neutral, natural aspects of human nature to distinguish those things. And so get better at that. Often, 
the Holy Spirit's influence. See, you can trust that you're hearing from the Holy Spirit when you don't have demonization and you're being moved to do things God's way, to think about things that God thinks about, to care about what God cares about, then you can have more confidence that it's either you, but it's still good, or it's the Holy Spirit. When you have a significant level of demonization, that makes it a little bit trickier because just because the thought comes to you, you have to be a little bit more critical about it. Now that's just, it just adds a little, another layer to it. But I would say we, either way, we, we need to test the spirits as first John four says, test the spirits and hold and to see if they come from God. And, you know, and Paul wrote in first Corinthians, don't treat prophecies with contempt, but test them and hold fast to that, which is good. So you still need to test it no matter what, but if you know that you have demonization, you need to test it more. You need to be cautious to pull the trigger and really take your time, weigh it more carefully and more analytically and say, and, and really pay attention to what Satan is trying to do in your life to cause destruction, right? With one person, he may be trying to get them to commit adultery or to lead them into lust. Another person may be, you know, being pulled off and they're giving into legalism and kind of going down that rabbit trail. And so no, hey, look at your the fruit of your life and at the fruit of your struggles and say, where does Satan have a foothold in my life? And then know that in that particular area, I need to be more cautious about, you know, what I'm uh, assuming is the Holy Spirit. But but I, I, one more thing I will say is the Holy Spirit, I, I've heard it said this way, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. Um, <laughs> there, I think there is a lot of truth to that statement. Um, I want to say, let's let's say he's not always a gentleman because the Holy Spirit, you know, when Ananias and Sapphira in Acts 5 lied to the Holy Spirit, they went, they dropped it. Okay, so you can't say, well, that's that's a gentleman. He's just gentle and he he's so, you know... But so he, he he is gentle, but he's also God. <laughs> so he he has all of the attributes as the Father and the Son. Jesus is called, you know, gentle and humble in heart, and um, you know, he he is also described, and he described himself as, uh, oh, what's the word? Um. He described himself as meek, right? And I have a whole uh, a blog article about meekness. If you want to know what meek is, look it up. Um, it's actually um, great writing. I put a lot of effort into it, and a lot of people have been blessed by it. But Jesus said, I'm meek and humble. And then, cut to scene two, he's flipping over the tables of the money changers at, in the temple and, you know, whip using a leather whip, right? So. Yes, the Holy Spirit likewise is a gentleman. He he guides us and leads us in a way that doesn't just override our free will. He you know the fruit of one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit that's described in Galatians 5 is self-control. So the Holy Spirit's not controlling you. He's not forcing you to do something. He's He's impressing upon your heart and your mind godly desires and a godly motivation and moving and influencing you to, to be in line with God's will and to, and to go after what God uh, wants you to be focusing on. And so he's not forcing you to do it. He's not forcing you to do it. And so there's this this you know demons sometimes will be very kind of subtle as well and kind of just influence you but a lot of times they're a little more aggressive because they have a they have an agenda 
and they're okay with overriding your will. They're okay with with pushing you to do evil, right? They don't want you to just freely they, they got a horse in the race, right? They want you to do evil. They want you to sin and to go into further bondage. And so you've the Holy Spirit is more gentle. And so when you when you feel when you analyze a thought or a feeling or a motivation or a behavior or, or or any of those things, and you think, this is something God would want me to be doing. Is this something that I would want to do on my own? Right? You know, an example of this, you know, that happened uh, yesterday was, you know, one person, instead of like, the human flesh is tired, it's late, it's 10 something. Oh, we're, you know, I'm okay with just going home and, and relaxing, right? When we felt Ah, oh, I think I really want to worship some more. Let's just keep going. And the one girl said, I've never felt, she's like, she actually said this. She goes, I, I usually, um, you know, we worship and I enjoy it. But um, I usually like afterwards, I'm like, okay, I'm ready to like do something else now. She's like, but tonight I, I felt like I just want to keep worshiping. <laughs> she goes, I, I think I want to go home and like worship some more even after we've been like doing this for hours and I'm like, yeah, that's the Holy spirit doing that. Like that's him moving in you and changing you. So when we, when, when we get stirred up in such a way, when what we're doing is not a flesh thing anymore, we are, we're pursuing something that really God wants us to pursue. Yeah. That's the Holy spirit leading you to do that. So that's his voice. That's him moving and speaking and guiding you. And so look for those kind of things. Yes, I'm, so I'm glad these testimonies are blessing you. Uh, let's see. Amen. God can be taking us through growth. Of course, he's always growing us. We're, we're not done growing until we become like Jesus in the resurrection. <laughs> you know, and, I, and like I said last week, I think we keep growing even in perpetuity. So I need to see another question. Uh, load, up, load up some more. Um, so you were talking about stepping out in faith which could lead to our freedom. However, in the past, I know I have taken leaps of faith in the wrong direction. How do I know if it's the right step? That's a good question. Um, how do I know if it's the right step? So two things. Yeah, I don't want to overwhelm you. I'm going to give you two basic principles. One is ask yourself the question, is this is this this decision, this stepping out, this direction I'm considering, is this in the sovereign will of God? And then the second question, is this in God's will for my life? So first, is this in the sovereign will of God? Get to know who God is and what he cares about. It's one of the things I talk about in the Empire Christian Roadmap. There's multiple sections. For one, I'll just kind of guide you through the template really quick just so you can kind of see how it's actually simple. It's just, it gets complicated when we're working it out emotionally in our own life because we're struggling. We're like, oh, it's, it's hard when, I, when it's me. But logically it makes a lot of sense first is this there's two directions heaven and hell eternal life or eternal damnation which direction does this direction take me in question number one question number two is principle number two am i reflecting the fact that i am a new car am i'm born again i'm regenerated am i reflecting a different character a different a different um, am I showing that God has changed me or am I resorting back to who I used to be? Now, step number three, if I go in this direction, is it, per, is it in the pursuit of sanctification? Am I becoming more holy, more godly, more righteous, more healed, more restored, more free, right? Am I, am I getting 
Am I becoming more like Jesus in all of these other ways? Am I th- are my thoughts better? My emotions better? My relationships better? Right? My my career focus, my my life balance, all these things. Four. Um, that actually ties into four, five. Um, fruitfulness. Does the fruit of my life bear more good fruit if I go in this direction versus if I go in this direction? Go in the direction of fruitfulness. And I have in that chapter, I have an entire uh, chart that I made of all the, the biblical fruits, a ton of them anyway, not all of them, but and then all the, the verse references, both inwardly, the inward fruit, the personal change of my life, my marriage, my family, my household, and so forth, as well as the outward fruit. How does this affect my church, my, my extended family, my community, and so forth, the world in general? And then the mission. This is the mission God has, the Great Commission, you know, witnessing to the lost, bringing healing, bringing restoration, helping the poor, you know, helping promote justice in society, helping, you know, all of encouraging love and, and, and all of these things. And so does it do that or does it not do that? Right. If, you, if you're doing all of these, if you can say yes, 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 yes then that's a good direction to go in. You know you're in line with God's sovereign will if you're doing all of these things because he doesn't want you to go to hell. He doesn't want you to act like the old you. He doesn't want you to not be free. He doesn't want you to to not be fruitful, right? This is just, it's sort of common sense, but when we're going through these decisions, we often don't think about all this stuff. So if you can, if you can answer yes to all these things, you can know, with confidence, you are in God's will going in the right direction. Now, the second part, what about it personally? So if you're personally, um, so maybe this is in God's sovereign will, it's in his larger will, right? The general direction that we're all going in. But the eighth principle is that God has a unique path for each one of us. And so maybe it's in God's, uh, the general direction but maybe God has a specific kind of plan uh, for you where he wants you to do a certain kind of thing that maybe he's not calling other people to do. And so those are a little bit um, harder to sort of nail down and, and define because it's so subjective, right? The other stuff, the first category, it's objective. Everyone else in the Christian community can say, yeah, that's a good thing to do, right? It's like, that's godly, that's good, that's righteous, it's holy, it's it's restorative, it's do it. But what about like the unique specific scenarios, which, uh, and, you know, f- and, and to be honest, the first category is way more important, just for the record. So, uh, you know, even if you have no idea about the second part, just do what's good in the first part. And so, but yeah, that comes from getting to know God personally and and to really pay attention to your life. And so in the eighth chapter, in the eighth principle, you know, we walk through these different things where your what God's calling you to, it, it comes from that personal relationship with him. So spend more quality time with him. Let him impress thoughts upon your heart. Let him guide your footsteps. And you'll, and if you're doing that regularly, you'll see the fruit of that. You'll feel more and more confident that what you're doing is in the right direction. Then you can step out in faith in that direction. It'll also often be in line with all of the other aspects of your life. It'll be in line with your values, which will be different from from somebody else's values. It'll be in line with your uh, shape, which is your you know, your S-H-A-P-E, your spiritual gifts, your abilities, which are your, or no, uh, H is heart, which is your heart's desires. What are you passionate about? What have you always kind of cared more about than some of the other believers around you? Like what, you know, what's that thing that that really inspires you or motivates you or, or that cause that you really care a lot about? It'll be in... God's unique will for you will be in line with that probably, right? Your The A, abilities, your natural talents and abilities. The unique thing that he wants you to do is probably in line with your 
the talents he's given you. Uh, P, your personality. It'll be in line with your personality type. And E, your personal experiences. The thing that the things that God has walked you through, the the part, the the stuff that He has worked through with your testimony, that's part of the unique calling. And so, that's all going to be part of it, right? The reason I'm so passionate about empowering and mobilizing Christians to be all that they can be. Is because I spent so many years as a lukewarm cultural believer who was not doing that. <laughs> I was still living in sin. I was still, you know, focused on being led by and pursuing idols without letting God come first, without finding my ultimate fulfillment in Him. And so that's my testimony. That's my experience. Right. So now I know that it's part of my calling, my unique direction, because it's in line with all like I'm passionate about that because I was there. That it that's me. That's who I was. Right. And and even now, like if Satan's gonna get me, he's gonna tempt me to go back to that. And so it's sort of like this ongoing thing and, and God's working through each of us that way. And so if you're stepping out in faith, um, in all ways, not only for freedom, but for growth and everything else that God has for you. Um, those are steps to take that can be that you'll know will be in the right direction. First, follow the sovereign will. Do it; it's good no matter what, even if it's not that unique, special thing that that God's calling you to. That will really be like the breakthrough that you're looking for. If you're in the general direction, right? You're on your way to heaven. You're a new, you're a new car. You're, you're a new creation. You're getting free. You're, you're being transformed and sanctified. You're pursuing freedom. You're pursuing the mission of the church. If you're doing all that, you're already narrowing it down a lot more than you think you are. And so, keep doing that, and you can have confidence that you're going in the right direction. And then if you're um, then when you bring all of that to your personal time with God, where you're talking with him and journaling with him and praying about it and seeking words of knowledge and wisdom from him, and, and God might be giving you dreams that help guide some of this conversation, and he might put it on other people's hearts. And so other people may prophesy to you or give words of knowledge to you, or they have dreams that impact you. And and you're part of the church, and you're you're active, and you're you're connecting with people, and that confirms the direction, right? Because I, you know, let's say I felt burnout, and I was like, maybe I'm just gonna, you know, not do the small group thing for uh, maybe I'll take a month off and just kind of regroup, reset, and then you know do something different later, and then. God moves me to do something very different last night. And I, I wasn't totally on board with that, but there was a part of my brain like maybe maybe I should do a reset and kind of just take a little time off, focus on maybe focus on the live shows or something else a little bit more. And then God does that and I see this transformation with everybody. And now I can be pretty confident. No, I'm doing the right thing. I'm in the right direction. See how God God did all that to confirm to me and help me continue on the path that I'm on. Or God may have done something very different that let me know, yeah, you should shift, shift and pivot and do something a little bit different. God moves through us these ways. And so whatever you're, um, you know, as you're, going through these things and you're thinking about all this stuff just look at your life pay be more observant this is why we don't do drugs or alcohol it's well it's not the only reason but it's one of the reasons why is so we can stay sober minded so we can think clearly so we can be like the bereans and test everything in the scriptures and to study and show ourselves approved as workmen who know God's word and who are walking with him. And so, all right, what other questions we got? <laughs> um, what does Satan look like? Is he a snake? 
Is he a dragon? Is he a goat? What does he look like? Um, yeah, this, this is kind of an interesting question. In, in a sense, Satan is depicted as all of these things. Ultimately, what Satan looks like is what he is. What he is, is an angel. He is an angel, and even more specifically, there there's different uh, classes of angels that are depicted in different um, forms. And so, the you have the one angel, you know, you have one angels, you know, who are described with with eyes all over and and different faces and multiple faces and different things. Um, and, and, you know, I don't know if this is just the way that some of the prophets were just seeing the picture or if this is what they actually look like. It's kind of, you know, it's kind of hard to, to say for sure. But one thing that we know for sure is that some angels um, are presenting themselves in angelic form to people and people know that they're angels and in, in scripture and they look like human beings. They look like men, um, young men, to be to be specific, um, most of the time. And this is how they're described. But they're also described as sort of bright and sort of powerful. Now, Satan is described. The sort of the pictures are in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, and he's described as an a cherub angel. So a cherub, which is a singular angel, or cherubim, which is plural, multiple. Multiple cherubs is a cherubim. And so he is described as a cherub angel. And so that's what he looks like. And we know for sure what they look like, not just because when people saw visions that they saw them, but God actually created the picture for us. He he impressed one of uh, I don't recall his name, but when Moses was given instructions to build the tabernacle, he God picked this man. He said, I have taught him and given him the ability to create all of this. And I've shown him exactly what it's supposed to look like. And there's the Ark of the Covenant, which is, you know, kind of like a sort of like a big box or a chest and inside that was Aaron's staff and the ten, the, the tablets with the 10 commandments on it and you know some a jar of manna and on top of that was a big platform yeah so I'm kind of <laughs> kind of doing a segue here uh, to another topic but I'll come back in a minute to describe uh, Satan more specifically but anyway on top of this um, Ark of the Covenant was what's called the mercy seat. And you have two cherub angels facing each other with, with their wings outstretched, like covering over the middle, right? So they're, they both have heads and bodies and arms, and they look like humans, basically, except they have wings, two wings each, right? Right and left. And both of them outstretch, and they both meet and cover over the center of the mercy seat. And God says that this is a picture of the tabernacle in heaven, where there's a cherub who covers the presence of God, because God's so holy, and it's sort of their wings are covering it. And I, uh, I'm I don't recall 100. percent I want to say maybe even there's like other wings that, or something that are covering their eyes. I might be confusing that with the seraphim. But anyway, an angel with wings. And Satan is described as the cherub angel. And so I have no reason to think that he is not still a cherub angel who looks like a cherub angel. right? Later, Paul wrote that Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So he has the ability to present himself in his actual form. He's described in Ezekiel 28 as beautiful, as wise, as powerful, as adorned 
with jewels on his chest. And so he probably still looks that way. He probably is attractive in his physical appearance. So, you know, and, and, and we could speculate on this. I, I actually do kind of a deep biblical study on, on the word terminology in, in the uh, spiritual warfare boot camp, but it's possible just, I'm just going to plant this seed. It's possible that when the serpent appeared to Adam and Eve, that he wasn't a snake. Um, it's possible. He might've been in angelic form and that's why he was so influential to Adam and Eve, right? He, the serpent said to Eve, if you eat of this fruit, then you'll be like God, knowing good and evil, right? He said, you'll be like us, right? And she's like, this, this being has wisdom. This being, it, you know, was he a little slithering creature? You know, we have to speculate a little bit, but... Because scripture does say snake, but that the same word for snake there is also the same word that we get the word occult from. And the word where we get divination. And it also means brightness. So there's it's kind of a word play happening here. Maybe it was a snake. Maybe he became a snake. Maybe there's, you know, it, it's hard to say for sure. But it kind of makes a lot of sense if he showed up as a powerful angel, why they were easily influenced and deceived. And it also makes sense because Satan's been doing that ever since. He presents evil and sin in an attractive way. He doesn't you most people who follow Satan, who do sin in the world, do not worship a form of Satanism that's dark. Most of them don't worship a form of Satanism where they wear all black hoods and you know they're slitting the throats of animals and they're dipping themselves in blood and their skulls and crossbones and and this dark gory kind of thing now there's some who do but but many of the people who are not saved yet form they 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 go after some form of godliness but it's not really of god it's a counterfeit of some sort. It's it's meant to be attractive because that's more deceptive. And so I think this is why uh, Satan is depicted in all of these lesser forms. He's depicted as a snake or a serpent, and maybe he took the form of a serpent in Genesis. I, I don't know for sure, but um, th that's what the scripture records, that he was a serpent. Um, and he's also described as the ancient serpent in Revelation. And so that's a consistent theme. That's what was written. That's what's recorded. God wants us to understand that. He's also described as a dragon. But I don't think he looks like an actual snake. And I don't think he looks like an actual dragon. I think he looks like a cherub angel. He's probably beautiful. Um, he... You know, he's probably, I think when, for instance, a lot of the cults have been started by something pretending to be Jesus, presenting himself to them in a way that was convincing. So I think when Joseph Smith, founder of Mormonism, saw the father in Jesus, he probably saw Satan in something else. Um. And it was probably a vision, probably not his true form, right? Satan doesn't have the ability to manifest and walk around on the earth like the other angels did, the other godly angels did in the Bible. I believe, and this is theology I walk through carefully in the, in the spiritual warfare boot camp, that none of the demons have the ability to manifest physically and walk on the earth and do whatever they want like, the, like God's angels could. I believe they're all bound in this spiritual realm, the abyss. So I think it's just a vision that he's giving to somebody because they do have the ability to give spiritual, supernatural visions to people. And then they can present themselves however they want to. They can present themselves as Jesus. They can present themselves as 
an angel, a cherub angel. They could present themselves as an alien or whatever they need to to convince the person to follow the lie. You know, most of the the you know the close encounters of the third kind when people encounter extraterrestrials, those are just demons. They're not actual aliens. There's a lot of scientific reasons to believe that we that Earth has not been contacted by extraterrestrials. It people on Earth have been contacted by extra dimensionals. Right? They're being contacted by demons from another dimension. And they have the ability to present themselves in whatever way that humans would find convincing. If people believe in aliens, they can show up as aliens. People believe in spirit guides, they'll show up as spirit guides. People believe in angels and think all angels are good and don't even realize the fact that a lot of angels on earth are fallen angels. They'll be angels. Right? This is what Satan does. This is the common denominator. And so he presents himself as all these things. What about the goat, though? Uh, I think I think there's a couple of reasons for the goat. Like you, you might have seen something called the Baphomet symbol, which is like a goat head with an upside down five point star. the The five point star is called a pentagram, which is used in witchcraft. Upside down, it's for Satanism, and then it's used the goat head, the Baphomet sign with the upside down star uh, represents Baphomet or Satanism. This is, I think there's a couple of reasons for the goat, um, the, or at least a couple of biblical reasons that I'm aware of. I'm not sure if other, if, you know, cause this isn't necessarily described in the Bible. Um, but one, one thing that came to mind was the idea of the scapegoat. So God said, I'm going to let, it, it was telling this is part of the Israelite law and the Torah. God would have, you know, the person would bring their offering, and this would be on the day on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, I believe. Um, and the high priest would sacrifice. Um, there would be two animals, two goats that were brought. One was sacrificed on behalf of the sins of the whole Israelite community, and the other was sort of they sort of placed their hand. I think they placed their hand on its head and and sort of like did like this transfer effect. Like you're going to carry the guilt and the burden and the shame of all these sins. And then that one was released off into the wilderness. And it was kind of like this idea of one goat is going to actually pay the penalty, but the other one is going to carry the weight of the responsibility. And so, um, yeah, so I, I, see, I see a note in the chat that caught my eye. Um, yep. Okay, good. So I already answered the question then. All right. So there is, yeah, and so this goat went and carried sort of that responsibility and guilt of, of the community. And I think God does this. Like Jesus is the sacrificial lamb, sort of the goat that took the sin payment. And Satan is sort of the other goat that that is still guilty. It, they carry the guilt of the sins committed by the community, and this kind of makes sense when you when you realize that Satan and the demons have influenced a lot of the sinfulness of humanity. Right? We, we're still guilty for the sins we've committed too, but but in a lot of ways, they played a role in us doing that. The, a lot of the temptations came from them. A lot of the influence came from them. And so God is putting a lot of that guilt on them. They're still in the wilderness, in the abyss, right? They're still far from God, separated. They deserve the death on the cross too. They deserve to, be, to have their, their throat slit, just like the other goat was. But but they're they're allowed to exist for right now. And so that's one of the reasons for the goat, I think. Um, and then the other the other goat symbolism from scripture that I'm aware of is when Jesus said, you know, after the resurrection at the great white throne judgment, there will be, you know, he will separate the sheep from the goats. And he will say, you know, to the sheep, it come you who were prepared um, before the foundation of the world to enter into the kingdom of your father, you know, and they get eternal life to the goats on the left. 
he's you know they've been prepared for death for destruction and so they get cast into hell um you know that was originally jesus says hell was originally prepared for the devil and his angels and so there is sort of the goat imagery is is sort of a sign of the damned if you will um not perfectly because in uh you know, goats were used for for godly sacrifices too. So there's nothing wrong with goats, just for the record. Uh, there's there's nothing wrong with goats because goats were also used to sacrifice to God, right? And still a holy creature. You're still allowed to eat it. Um, and uh, you know, actually, a couple of years ago, I was in Mozambique and um, in like village, and we, you know, somebody, you know, they killed a goat and we ate it to the glory of the Lord. Um, you know, and, and and while we're on the topic. Snakes are also not evil, people. <laughs> uh, snakes are not evil. I actually used to own a snake. I had a ball python for many years. And, um, you know, sometimes a person's fascination with snakes could be demonic, could be the reason, because there's so much connection with that ancient serpent, that ancient dragon, you know, that sometimes we are drawn to snakes to have snake tattoos snake pictures snake art snake jewelry because of the demonic symbolism and connection but the snake animal itself is not an accursed animal it's not a wicked animal doesn't mean you're going to go to hell if you have a snake or if you like snakes um because jesus you know it, at one point when the israelites were being attacked um, it, was, it was actually a form of judgment. So here we see the dichotomy again. The Israelites were doing some sin, and God allowed a bunch of serpents to go into the Israelite camp and bite people, and they were dying. And so the snake here is a form of judgment, right? It is a form of, it could be a form of judgment and consequence of sin. But then God says, here's what I want you to do. Take one of the, you know, make a snake, a bronze serpent, put it up on a pole, and everyone who looks to it in faith will be healed, right? So they get bit by a snake as the consequence of, like, sin against God. But then if they look to the bronze serpent, then they would be healed. And then later, Jesus says, just as Moses lifted up the bronze serpent in the wilderness and all who looked on it would be healed. The son of man will be lifted up on a pole and all who look to him will be healed. So the snake there is a picture of Jesus. So we can't say all goats are evil. Can't say all snakes are evil. So have deeper theology than that. Don't be one of these weird fringe people who come up with all their weird conspiracy theories and all snakes are the devil now um you know but i will i will give the warning that throughout history satan has used the imagery of a snake as something to be worshiped that connected to his kingdom so you have ancient egypt with demonic idols holding snakes you had this the pharaoh with the snake right here um at his crown in his um hat you had babylon and ancient greece and so many so many false religions so many occult systems use the snake and so be very cautious about um the things you use with snakes make sure you don't have any junk in your bloodline in your history that would connect you to satan's influence through that imagery make sure you don't have a weird fascination with it but if you see a garter snake in your yard those are the ones we have over here in florida it doesn't mean you got a bunch of demons um and it's if you have a snake and you just happen to like snakes, but you don't have any other evidence of a bunch of demonization, you're probably okay. You don't have to freak out about it. And uh, and if you're one of these weird conspiracy people who thinks that you know there's Nephilim walking around on the earth and that they're reptilian snake people, um, 
turn off any YouTube channel that's saying that. <laughs> Seriously. Um, it's so weird. That's not what the Nephilim are. Uh, yeah, I don't even want to get all into it now. But if somebody says there's Nephilim reptile snake people walking around, hiding, and that's what the Antichrist is doing, yeah, turn that garbage off because they are deceived. They probably have their own demons if they believe that. And so, um, yeah, that I think that somebody needed to hear that. So <laughs> I pray that blesses you guys. Um, we are about out of time. Um, let me see if there's any other questions in here that are quick. Um I think, yep, I think we're good for now. Um, all right, well, that is Freedom Friday. Um, I pray the Lord's blessings on everyone who watches this. I pray that you would have an encounter with the Holy Spirit that sets you free, total freedom, total healing, total deliverance. I pray that every part of your mind, body, will, emotions, would be consecrated and sanctified by the Lord, and that you would be conformed into the image of Jesus. Until next time, be empowered and go and advance the kingdom of God. God bless.